cybersecurity is one of those fields that there's a 0% unemployment rate in cybersecurity. There's a 0% unemployment rate Insane. in this field. And there's over 4 million jobs today unfilled worldwide. And 1 million of those jobs are in the United States. And so that statement, that statistic right there should be all the fuel that people who look like us and come from where we come from, right, should be able to say, you know what, this is an opportunity. This is, a, this is an industry with unlimited earning potential, and it's only going to continue to grow. In terms of cybercrime damages, right, in 2021, we observed $6 trillion in cybercrime damages. 6T with a trillion. In 2023, cybercrime damages exceeded $8 trillion. And in 2025, cybercrime damages are going to be exceeding $10.5 trillion. Now, the scary part about what I just said is that the cybersecurity industry is only worth $400 billion. So when you look at those numbers, right, $10.5 trillion, if we were to measure cybersecurity damages in terms of GDP, it would be the third largest global economy after the US and China. And so when you break those numbers down, $8 trillion, that's $665 billion a month, which is twice the industry valuation and market cap in one month of cybercrime damages, which is like $275,000 a second. A million dollars just got lost. A million dollars was just stolen. And so that's not, a, that's not a big goal in the grand scheme of things. And it's only going to continue to expand with the use of and adoption of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, blockchain technology. Bro, what I got to do to save my life, dog? <laughs> like, like, like. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of In The Little Room Podcast, where we learn, laugh, and heal. And today is another special moment. You know, for those who are new, if you just came across this channel and you might be here for the first time because of my guest, and I want to say thank you for taking the time, but you're in my crib. We're in my living room, so take your sneakers off and subscribe to the channel right now because I don't play that. You feel me? I get good people here with good messages and great stories that you can either build your belief or understand what's capable to happen in the marketplace. I found this man at the vendor's marketplace in InvestFest. Shout out to Earn Your Leisure. That was a great, great event. And, and ultimately, look, I feel like you're supposed to connect with the people that's aligned for you to connect with. God works in mysterious ways, and he works the way he's supposed to. And today, I'm excited about this because it's something that, one, honestly, I got an email not that long ago saying I should change all my passwords. <laughs> that was number one. Where I was like, Yo, hold on, what's going on? I got a notification. Where'd that email come from? It wasn't even an email, actually. It was Apple showed me that I should like update all my passwords. We talked about that. We talked, yeah, we're going to talk about that. Uh, number two is something that I think we had a few, it's funny because when I had the mayor here, it was a scare of a cyber attack and I never really understood how these things happen, right? I don't understand cybersecurity or anything of that nature. So we got the man today. It says here, over a hundred million in salary offerings. Yes, sir. The founder of Cyber Exodus? Exodus. Exodus, I'm sorry. The the founder of Cyber X is the one and only Mr. TJ Sims is in the building. Clap for this gentleman one thank you, thank time. You, thank you. Clap it up one time. It's a pleasure to be here. Listen, first and foremost, my brother, I, I want to appreciate the fact that when we connected, um, networking tip right here, not only did you like, you were firm, clean, sharp, obviously, it was only a moment. Shout out to my man, Trail. You connected Trail. us. Sure. Appreciate you, my brother. But you, you took my contact down, you then follow up with a picture so you can remember who I was, and your follow through was instantaneous, bro. It's like curry. Just like curry. It ain't even gonna <laughs> lie. So I first wanna let the people know before we get into all your accolades and what you've done, who is TJ? Well, first and foremost, bro, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. So I appreciate you being receptive to that. Sure. Um, but yeah, bro, um, my name is William TJ Sims. Uh, cybersecurity analyst, uh, visionary by day, disruptor, futurist by night, <laughs> um, and founder of CyberXius. Uh, we are a cybersecurity and professional development skills training program 
for high school students. Uh, so we primarily focus on early career exploration. And so, um, yeah, man, it's just it's incredible to be here. I'm so happy to be able to share this platform with you and be able to just tell my story, talk a little bit about my why and you know what we're doing. Okay, so as we get there, why cybersecurity? And I love the fact, so just so you know, we both in this, here's a big message here. What are the chances of one meeting a young man 29 years old, by the time this comes out, he might be 30. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, um, but, but why target high school kids um, and not a person of our age, right? Why target that audience? I think, you know, it really boils down to kind of just my experience. Um, I think that, you know, coming from an underrepresented background, growing up a minority amongst minorities, um, you know, when I was growing up, my five closest friends and family were convicted felons. You know, they all did state time. They all did fed time. Um, you know, I'm no stranger to that. And um, I think a lot of people, you know, kind of unfortunately share that same reality. And it's really, it boils down to a lack of education. And so for me, when we say, you ask me why cybersecurity, I got into cybersecurity out of desperation. You know, growing up 200% below the poverty line, single family home, you know, it was really like, I had to be really tactical with, my decision making. You know, I'm the oldest, you know, I have a younger sister who's eight years younger than me. And so, you know, I didn't have anyone to kind of guide me and serve as those, gu those guardrails, you know, it was kind of like trial and error. Mm. And so when I was growing up, I was like, you know, I didn't have the, the luxury to, to just, you know, I had this urgency. And I identified early on that cybersecurity or tech was one of the two fields that I felt were going to put me in a position where I'd, I was never going to be at the mercy of a person or a situation or an economy. Hmm. And so I think that that was my whole reason. I stumbled into cyberspace out of desperation, you know, having my back against the wall, and here we are. You know, it's very interesting because one, there's two things you say here, all right? 200% behind the poverty line, right? That, that right there is what catches my attention. Let's, let's just put the elephant out the room, right? First time I met you, you're a light-skinned man. Yes, sir. All right. So I'm like 200% under the poverty line. Now, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to listen. Sure. What do you mean by that exactly? You gave me that you have some people that are, you know, around fellas and things of that nature. But then you also gave me an equation mathematically. Yes, sir. To kind of, you know, make sense of what you're saying to me. Can we get into more details of what you mean by that? So those who are watching, here's what I want you to know. that like, I'm a fan of people's stories. All right. And some people are more fans of their excuses. So I want you to give more in detail what you mean by that and, you know, as you stumbled across cybersecurity, um, how you actually, coming across it is one thing, but what was the actual story? Like, what was the day that you said, you know, maybe I want to do tech? You know what I mean? So I think I should tell you a little bit about my experience growing up. So I'm sure many people can relate. I grew up in a, when I say 200% below the poverty line, you know, I grew up in the lowest... I would say the lowest underrepresented public housing complex in Long Beach, New York. And a lot of people, they don't understand when they say Long Beach, right? right? Because majority of the community is probably middle income, right? It's a fairly well-off city. For sure. It's actually a city on Long Island. Mm -hmm. If you look it up, Long Beach, New York, it's a city in Long Island. Mm. And so a lot of people have a misconception on what that actually means. But I always say that the lines in the sand don't determine right? The reality and people relate through struggle and experience. Mm. So yes, Long Beach is a middle income, probably even high income city. But my reality was when I walk into my building, I was literally walking past like 10 essays sitting on the steps. And then when I walked up the stairwell, because the elevator was broken nine times out of 10, if you know, you know, <laughs> right. I was stepping over four bodies. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So my reality was a little bit different. And so, you know, when I say that the lines in the sand don't determine that, you know, that's a fact. And so 200% below the poverty line, you know, when I went to college, um, and I, I kind of talk about this a lot, but um, when I was filling out my FAFSA, it was based on the household composition. And I needed my mom for that because I obviously was, you know, in going to school. And I was like, your mom, so what's the household composition? She was like, well, I just filed and you know, I made $4,200 for the year. And I was looking at, I'm like, $4,200? I'm like, what's the average, what's the poverty rate for a three-person household? It's me, mm -hmm. my sister, my mom. Mm -hmm. It's like $45,000. I'm like, yo, we are significantly disadvantaged. But, you know, every negative situation, right, you can extract the positive out of every negative situation. And so I realized, I mean, we were so damn broke. That's how I was able to go to school for free. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so just taking it back, you know, I grew up 
I call it like a laundromat baby. You know, I, the, the the lady in the laundromat was like my, my like my nana. Right. Shout out to Anna. <laughs> right. Um, and so growing up in the in the laundromat, you know, my mom would be in the laundromat like four days a week, bro. Mm -hmm. Like I don't understand. She's still the laundromat queen. <laughs> right, right. But <laughs> she's still a laundry queen. Right, right, but God right. bless that. God bless her. I love her to death. And um, you know, just growing up in the laundromat, it was like my it was like a broke kids after school program. And so she had to find ways to, con to kind of keep me content and occupied. And so they had these gumball machines. And these gumball machines had these little, like, you know, these little, uh, you know, gooey toy, gooey right, guys. Right. I called them gooey guys. Right. And there were things like, like the hand that you can, with an with a, with a attachment, and you can, like, throw it against the wall and it would stick to the wall. And so she used to buy me those for, like, 25 cents. And I'd, you know, go to school with, like, four of them. Mm. And that's how I really just became a hustler and, and an entrepreneur. Is like, I used to go to school. I used to take those gooey guys for 25 cents. I used to flip them, sell them for, like, a dollar to the kids who used mm. to live on the east side mm. and the west side and the west end who had the bread. Mm -hmm. And I used to go there and I used to sell them to those kids. And so after I would sell those, those, those gooey guys to the kids that I was in class with, then when I got to lunch, I used to go and I used to buy fruit snacks and Gushers, fruit roll-ups, and then I'd get to class and I'd sell those. So I'd be coming home with $20. Mm. My mom would be like, yo, how are you doing this? <laughs> like, I sold my gooey guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's how I really became like an entrepreneur and started really like, you know, just understanding like, you know, survival because I didn't have lunch money. And I was a kid who grew up in the free lunch line. So you had to figure out a way. If you didn't have what you need, you make do with what you have. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of like those skill sets, that... When I say desperation got me into cyberspace, that's exactly what I mean. And and I love giving us that that background to get more grasp of you know your personality and how you got to where you at. Because to be honest, I don't know. You might be the first person I know in cybersecurity, bro, or in the cyberspace. I we gotta say. change that. You know what I mean? Like we go, we have. We, to. He won't. Hey, I won't be the last. You know what I mean? So here's <laughs> what I mean. Like nothing. What else inspired? Like knowing that you say that this is a, is a space where. Recession proof, pandemic proof, right? These are things that bulletproof. Bulletproof. Who in your family, you know, helped you? Was it someone that you know directly to say, "Hey, oh, my friend's in cyber, oh, he's in the cyberspace. I want to do that." Like, what intrigued that, and not finance, and you know, a, a regular brick and mortar business? You know what I'm saying? And what age did you start? You know. I wish I can actually shout out somebody right now and be like, yo, this person is the reason I got into cyberspace, but I can't identify a person in terms of who pushed me or led me to this you know, career path. But what I can say is that when I was growing up, I was very tactical. And when you come, when you come from a disadvantaged background, you have to learn how to maneuver through the weeds, right? It's a survival skill. It's not something that you learn in school. It's something that you learn when you are facing challenges, right? When you're, when, you're, when you're staring at struggle dead in the eyes and you smile like, I'm finna fuck this up. Mm -hmm. you know? And if you need to cut that up, you, you, know, good. you gotta you do good. that. You good. But when you wake up every single day and you stare struggle dead in the eyes and you're like, yeah, I'm ready for more. Like, no matter what, you're not gonna break me. That's a, it's, it's a different type of dog. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you know, with that being said, um, I, I was very tactical and I identified two I would say two disciplines that were like gonna ultimately liberate my family from poverty. And when I say we grew up like disadvantaged, I mean like like eviction notices on the door. Like when food stamps ran out, empty fridge. That's mm -hmm. what I mean. And so the two career paths that I identified was was medical, because people were always gonna get sick, and tech, because technology is always evolving. And so when I first got into college, when I graduated, the same day I graduated high school was the day that I went off to college. The same day, like literally graduation, no party, and then in the car, three Going hours upstate Poughkeepsie, and I went to and I, I was on my way to Marist College. And so I was fortunate, like I said, being so broke helped me get a full scholarship. I had a full scholarship to college through an HEOP program, which stands for Higher Education Opportunity Program, mm. and so which was an academic scholarship. And I was a fair, I was a fair student, but because we were so broke. I was able to qualify for that. And so I got to school, you know, and I did what everybody does when they go to college and they don't know what to do. I majored in business mm -hmm. because that's what you do when you don't know what, what you want to do. Business administration. You kind of, you know, right? Business administration. It just it buys you time. Right. And so, but at that moment, because I was thinking, and like I said, I was being very tactical, I was like, yo, what are the, what's the, what are the two, what are the fields can I get into? Mm. And I was like, all right, medical and tech. And this is around 2013. So at this point, Instagram just came out. And so obviously I'm like, well, you know what? I don't really want to do med school because I'm not, I, don't, I didn't feel like I was smart enough for that. Like I wasn't mm -hmm. gifted academically. Mm -hmm. I worked hard, but I wasn't gifted. And so 
I was like, nah, I don't think I really want to do that and go into you know a quarter million in debt. Right. So I was like, you know what? Let me. I think tech is probably gonna be my route, but. Computer science kind of scared me because it was very mathematical and calculus, and that was never a Answer strong suit. All my questions. And so IT, I was like, IT, that's that sounds that sounds good. And so on the last day of school, um, I'll never forget this, but you know, May thirteenth, uh, twenty thirteen, I got locked up. I had mm. a knock on my door, and it was the head of security, and they were like, "Are you William Sims?" And I was like, "Yes." I was like, "Do you have your phone and your key?" I'm like, "Yeah, why? What's up?" And they were like, "Are oh, you need to come with us?" And it was that morning around eight o'clock, I was supposed to take an exam and leave for spring for school break. All right. And I found myself in Dutchess County Jail later on that night, facing three to fifteen for a gang assault. And so at that moment, my world came to a screeching halt because I woke up in the dorm and went to sleep in a cell. Hmm. And I lost a full scholarship. So how do we train how do we bounce back from this? How do how do I go from being in a cell, a scholarship? One, what's the first phone call back home? I got to hear how mom, does mom know about yeah, this as soon as it yeah. happens? And what's the mindset of TJ while he's in the cell? Yeah, bro, I was, uh, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and I was 18 years old, you know, I was 100, 120 pounds soaking wet. And I just remember, um, you know, just take a step back. What actually happened was it was a, a fight that happened off campus two weeks prior. And there was, I was with a group of, I was with a group of people walking to a club and because they, we were all going to the same plot, I was like, all right, I'm going to walk with y'all. And it was a mm-hmm. bunch of football players. And as we were walking, you know, they, I guess, saw like a, a rugby player or something they had some animosity with and they surrounded him. And I was like, it was one dude with like nine, nine heads. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't, I don't condone that. Right. Like, regardless of what the beef is, it's one guy by himself. I just didn't condone it. So I right. kept it moving. I kept walking. And so a brawl took place, you know, obviously someone got hurt really bad. And, um, you know, two weeks later, they were knocking on my door because, again, people wrote statements saying I did something I didn't do. So I was definitely wrongfully accused of that. Mm -hmm. Um, But thankfully, by the grace of God, I was able to maintain my innocence, beat the case. But it did cost me a scholarship. I was terminated. I wasn't allowed to go back to school. Um, But that year that I took off, you know, hiring lawyers, you know, that's where I really dug deep and really tried to find myself and really try to put a plan together to figure out you know, how I was gonna go ahead and, and make this pivot. And so after I beat the case and took a year off, I enrolled in Nassau Community College and I majored in information technology. And it was at that moment, right, where I was at school and I had like an eight hour gap in my schedule that I was like, yo, I need to go get some bread. I need to get a part-time job. Mm-hmm. And I walked to the mall, Roosevelt Field, and I started going into places like Foot Locker, foot action champs just to get some part-time income since I'm right. sitting at school for so right. for so long I don't got enough you know right I can't go back home and then come right. back to school so I was like let me go get a job and work in the middle of the day and then go back and take the classes at night and so I remember walking past those different stores and I seen Louis Vuitton remember this is like November this is like middle of November you know 2014 so it's cold I got my true religion sweats <laughs> you know I got my uh Versace scully on with, with a kilogram I'm not looking like presentable feeling like I can go into Louis but mm. this small voice just said like go in there just go in and I remember walking in there and this gentleman greeted me at the door and of course he said what everybody says you know that we could apply online mm. but he's like you know what just stay right here I'll, I'll print it out for you and at that moment he printed it out for me and so I sat in VIP Drinking, drinking some of their sparkling water, <laughs> filling out the application, and I handed it in and I left. And I was three stores down by Urban Outfitters when I got a phone call. Shout out to Melvin. He was the manager that was on break. He called me and he was like, hey, are you still around? And I'm like, what? Like, I ran right back into <laughs> that right store. In. Like, I'm here. I'm like, what's up? <laughs> he was like, listen, you can start in two weeks. He said, it's mm. a 30-day seasonal shift. It's a 30-day job during the most busiest time of the year, right? From December 1st to January 1st. Mm. And I was like, bet, it's a, it's a wrap. So of course, during that 30 day shift, now I'm, I'm, I'm obviously like in Louis Vuitton where I'm, I'm selling bag, $3,000 bags. And so I remember like this was yesterday, it was day 23 of my 30 day shift, December 13, excuse me, December 23rd, 2014. And I took the next couple in line and it was a husband and wife, and he was literally last minute shopping, panicking, trying to get his wife a bag. And I remember during that 45 minute duration of the sale, just communicating to him like what I'm trying to do and, you know, just building rapport with my client. Mm. And I guess he felt the, you know, the passion. He was like, you know what, 
He's like, when you get one semester closer to graduating, you know, reach out to me and I'll give you a resume. And this man happened to be the director of the criminal investigations unit for the part, Department of Financial Services. And so it was that contact, that, that business card that I obtained during that transaction that changed the trajectory of my life because when I followed up and I followed through, mm -hmm. he gave my resume to the CIO and I skipped over 800 applicants to get my first internship on Wall Street at the Department of Financial Services. Insane yep. story. And dog. that's how I got into cybersecurity. And it was at that moment, right, after my 30-day shift ended at, at Louis Vuitton, it was that job at Louis that then got me a job at Rolex right up the street selling $60,000 watches. And so I went from selling $3,000 bags to $60,000 watches. And so every, every single person that came into that store, you know, I greeted as Mr. Important or Mrs. Important, got their business card, and build relationships. Where you learn this from, bro? Like, like where shout out, shout out to where I'm from, man. Those keen set projects in Long Beach, <laughs> New York. If you know, you know. Yo, bro, that is an incredible show because so many people with two things. When you're saying that to me, here's what stood out to me. The voice that tells you to go into the store, even though you feel like you weren't dressed to go in. Yeah. Right? Yep. And instantly how that decision. Bro, your life could have went completely another way. Who knows if you didn't go into that store? You get this intern. Do you feel like you're qualified to work here? Are you overwhelmed? <laughs> you know, absolutely like... not. Absolutely not. <laughs> Definitely overwhelmed um, because it was my first take at like really like you know being in a corporate environment. Like I was at Louis and that was great, but it was retail. You know what I'm saying? I come. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you're growing up and you're hustling, like sales is your first, like that's, right. your, that's your- That's where the money you know what is. That's where the money is. So like I knew sales, like, you know, I could sell, I could sell salt to a slug, but right, this was my first time going, like at this point, I'm literally traveling into Wall Street, on State Street, right next to Wall Street, downtown in the district, three days a week. And mind you, this is a non-paid internship. So I'm not getting paid for this, but I understand on the back end, right, I understand like how this is going to help me catapult my success forward. And so, nah, I was kind of lost, but- at the same time, I'm a likable person. And I think another thing too, when you're growing up disadvantaged, one thing that I learned growing up is that when you're challenged, our struggles and our experiences are our greatest strength. And so what that taught me was that it taught me how to get acclimated in any environment. And so even though I was uncomfortable, I knew how to survive and knew how to thrive. And that was a key thing. So it kind of helped me kind of maneuver. It helped me kind of you know grow and, and evolve throughout that process. I love it. All right. Now, now I'm going to ask you questions because I have no idea. Like, I feel like the, if y'all with me, I have no <laughs> idea what your job consists of, right? Like, right. I understand it's protecting us to some degree. Right. But what is it exactly that you do, right? Or, or maybe when you started, what were the key elements you needed to understand? Because to me, it sounds like a foreign language, another country, another... What is cyber security or what is cyber... Um, and what you was doing your first job, what exactly did you do and what did that entail? So you'll hear this term cybersecurity, you'll hear, you know, data security, information security, right? They're all kind of used interchangeably, but in Lehman's terms, just so that everybody can understand, you know, cybersecurity is securing data, it's securing infrastructure, uh, it's securing people. And there's so many correlations that I learned just from growing up, right? In the street, like there's so many different correlations, right? When you're, when you're having to you know, make it all make sense. So I always try to associate these new concepts, best practices, you know, procedures with like something that I can uh, associate to how I grew up. Mm. It helped me understand it better. And so, you know, cybersecurity is the protection of data infrastructure. Um, and so in my job, in what I've been doing for the last eight years is incident management and response. So I kind of work in what's called a uh, security operation center, which is like the nucleus of an environment or a nucleus of um, a corporation. And so, you know, cybersecurity is the front line of defense and it's the backbone to every single business and industry known to man. And so what my job consists of is, is monitoring, right? Um, re monitoring and responding to alerts and detections that are set in place so that companies don't get hacked. And so when there is something that goes wrong, it's my team, which is the cybersecurity incident response team, that is the one who is investigating, that is the one who is, you know, working through that incident. Right. Mm -hmm. Looking at the logs, looking at the data, you know, validating the traffic, you know, and if it needs to be escalated, you know, escalating it. And if it needs to be contained, containing it. And if mm -hmm. it needs to be mitigated, mitigating it. I feel like it's the the ultimate war that we don't see day to day. Right. Like because. Absolutely. 
there's a ba- someone trying to get it. So here's what I'm seeing too, right? Like big corporations. One, us as a country almost got look like we got shaken up. Two, AT and T hacked. T Mobile hacked. Like as we grow in technology, this fear of are we really safe and how fast can we get to it? Do you feel like this is a reason why you would always have a job, but are you ever in Absolutely. fear that someone gets to the information before you do? And is there ever a time where it may be a little too late? That's a great question. I think um, just being direct, the first thing I learned in cyberspace is that there's no such thing as 100% security, right? Mm. And because if there was, then obviously like people couldn't access systems. Like if it's 100% secure, you can't get in. Right. But obviously people are gonna need to access systems. We live in a interconnected, interconnected world where you know there's a lot of you know um, companies that are doing business with other companies, right? They're, they are um, warehousing data, right. and so systems and infrastructures are going to need to be impacted. So if people can can access systems, then the, then they're susceptible to an attack. And so we live in the world of information technology and, and digitalization, and now artificial intelligence, which a lot of people are coming privy to. But the reality is, artificial intelligence has been around for years, maybe right. like sixty years, right. and so. Artificial intelligence is a tool, and it's great, but it's also used by threat, as- threat actors and nation states to perform malicious activities and malfeasant things. So, right as technology continues to evolve, you know IOCs. You know, I noticed that you had a, a, a inner. I noticed that you had a tech-enabled fridge, right? right? And a lot of people have those. A lot of people have tech-enabled air conditionings, mm-hmm. right? They have right. We live in the world of IoT, whether it be an Apple Watch. You know what I'm saying? Your AirPods. Right, everything's connected, and so the average household has like fifty interconnected devices. Mm-hmm. And so, as the landscape expands, so does the attack landscape. And artificial intelligence is going to only accelerate that. And so, you know, it's crazy, but you know, we're the front line of defense, and we're the backbone. And so, for me, I was like, you know what, this is a pretty like I was coming from a financially secure mindset. I was like, okay, this is a financially secure decision, but how can I transpire this thinking into financial freedom and how can I leverage this vehicle Mm. and you know cybersecurity is one of those fields that there's a zero percent unemployment rate in cybersecurity there's a zero percent unemployment rate in this field and there's over four million jobs today unfilled worldwide and one million of those jobs are in the United States and so that statement that statistic right there should be all the fuel that people who look like us and come from where we come from, right, should be able to say, you know what, this is an opportunity. This is a this is an industry with unlimited earning potential and it's only gonna continue to grow. All right, because the tech space keeps growing. It's only gonna continue to grow. So tell me about this is why this is crazy. Bro. And if I'm not answering your questions, no, no. please just I'll, I'll circle revert. back. No, no, I'll revert. I'll revert. So um, here's what I want to know. Because there's so much, why do you feel like there's so much availability, right? If there's 0% unemployment rate, how come more of us are not running to this space? Is it because we feel like, what's the certification process? Do I need four years of college? Do I need a master's? Like, why do I feel that we don't know for a reason? Why do, how do I not know about this availability? And what's the average salary for someone who gets started in cyber security? So to answer your first question, why people aren't tapping in, I think it's a matter of exposure, right? So people who look like us come from where, from where we come from, right? We're not exposed to this skill set. Mm-hmm. Right? It doesn't look like us. It doesn't sound like us. It doesn't feel like us because mm-hmm. cybersecurity is a white male dominated industry. And so there's less than 20% representation in tech, let alone cybersecurity. Black and black and brown and Latin women make up less than 2% of the workforce. Jeez. And so we haven't been exposed to this. And I think that's really the mission. That's the kind of like the, the backbone of our brand vision and movement at Cyberexius is like, we're, we're literally leveling the playing field and shifting the dynamic for underrepresented youth because most of the youth and most of our community hasn't been exposed to this. And so I talk, a bit, I talk about it all the time. Cybersecurity is 
the answer to solving the economic wealth gap. It's, it's plain and simple. It's like mm -hmm. when we talk about, you know, the future of work and right, what's important, like cybersecurity has to be embedded in the conversation. And so I feel like a lot of our youth, a lot of the folks that, you know, our friends that we grew up with, right, they're still trying to be ball players. They're still trying to be rappers. And it's like, I feel like that's great. But at the end of the day, you need to have a solid stream of income, like right. first step. Like you need to have a consistent stream of income. And for me, it was like, yo, cybersecurity makes sense because instead of trying to start with a $30,000 pool of resources, right, I can start with a $100,000 pool of resources, right? And so when you ask me about average annual salaries and compensation, it varies depending on your, on your experience, of course. And this is, a, this is a space that respects skill set. It's not a space that like credentials so much matter anymore. Mm. It's the trade of the 21st century. And so companies are hiring folks with non-traditional backgrounds all the time. And those companies are, are companies like Deloitte, right? Mm -hmm. The big four big, accounting and, and advisory firms, accounting. right? EY, PwC, Google, IBM, AWS, Booz, Booz Allen Hamilton. These are companies who are hiring people who don't even have degrees or certifications. And I think, you know, they're great, right? Education is important. And it comes in all forms, shapes, or sizes, but right, what it all boils down to is being able to identify with the role. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have to focus on. I talk about this all the time, like the 5E formula for success, which stands for exposure. You got you to gotta get exposed to know something exists in order to be able to take advantage of the opportunity. And so I was thankfully and fortunately exposed. And then the second element in that equation is education. And education comes in forms of podcasts. It comes in forms of certifications, degrees, right, books, you name it. But don't be addicted to the education and allergic to the execution. And Ooh, that's one the more time, one more time. Tell, come on, yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Nehemiah Davis, because I actually Hello. got that bar from him that's hard. At, at InvestFest. But he said, you know, don't be addicted to the education, right? And read a hundred books and not take action because then you're an educated fool mm -hmm. and be allergic to the execution. Mm -hmm. And so that's the education component or the second element in that equation. The third element, right, was execution, right? 75% mm -hmm. of people fail to take action. Mm -hmm. And the fourth element is evolution, right? As we transition, as we start to implement, right, these different things, we begin to evolve. And so ultimately, which have those four elements have a compound effect, and that stands for empowerment, mm -hmm. right? We can empower our communities if we apply that formula. And cybersecurity is economic. Is cybersecurity is a skill set that will liberate the economic wealth gap in underrepresented communities. So, did you ever feel uh, privy to like do a crash course or work? let me just say this for my people who are listening? Are you open to doing like maybe off offline thirty minute call, forty five minute call to give us more of an understanding of where to go and how to start things of that nature? Those who follow us, I'm gonna work the the, um, the business after that, whatever the case is, just some, a visual aspect to see like, if you want to start, here's where you go. Are you open to something like that? Absolutely. I would love that. I've, right? been, I've, been, I've, been, I've been craving something like that because, you know, the more that we can talk about this, the more that, you know, we as a collective can get in front of the, the community mm -hmm. and, and, and it can sound like us and look like us and we walk, talk and chew gum the same, mm -hmm. the more that the next generation is going to be interested. You know, I just did an event in, in Newark the real money experience in uh, Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And there was like a couple hundred youth. And, Excuse me. Um, I remember I had about like five minutes where I could actually talk to the youth and kind of did a little bit of a, just a, a, a quick little, had a little quick conversation. And at the end of my, my spiel, I had like, I was surrounded by like this group of 18 year olds mm -hmm. that were just like, yo, how can I, you know, cause I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm, lo I'm looking like them, you know? Mm -hmm. And these cats, they're, they're hustling just for a pair of shoes. They right. just, they, they're hustling for a pair of Jordans, you know? So for them or for a chain or, or, mm -hmm. or a watch. Mm -hmm. And so I'm over here, I'm, I'm exposing that because, you know, like I said, I used to work at Louis. I used to work at, at Rolex. These things don't phase me, even though I got them, it's like, like, what they're hustling for, risking their lives, right? They can have tenfold if they develop this skill set that's not disposable. And so when I'm giving game and I'm telling them like, yo, it looks like us and they feel it and they can tell because people relate through struggle and experience, sure. right? They can tell when you're lying. They can tell when you're like, you know, it doesn't resonate because I'm not a 50 year old white man with a beer belly trying to get them to understand something that's foreign. <laughs> right. And so they were like, yo, like, how can I, like, what is this? How can I tap in? Like, right. I, I, I can have my cake and eat it too. Right. Like, I can get a pair of J's. Like, mm -hmm. I can take care of my family mm -hmm. for real. And I'm like, yeah. So, 
you know, I actually did a group session with them yesterday. Fire. Yeah, with that group. Shout out to EOF, Extension of Family. We out here. Love and that. so what I did was I told them, though, listen, if y'all tap in with me and y'all follow up and follow through, that I'll, I'll lead y'all to the finish line. And so they're going to be represented on our accelerator program with the other three schools we have participating. It's going to be this group, EOF, from Newark, New Jersey, going to have an opportunity to tap in with the other students and collaborate and compete at the highest level. So break that down for me. Like, what is exactly, what do your company do? Right now, so first and foremost, I can't tell, the details and all that, when this comes out, maybe a Zoom call? Yeah, so we can degree. get it cracking. We'll get, we'll get running, up and running for that. So be on the lookout on the details below for that for sure. But talk to me about your company, right? Like, how did you get to expose this to the high school students, right? What was your process of doing that? Because people don't understand the process. Absolutely. Right? Um, and what's the most fulfilling thing about the work? Three-part question. How do you get to, to your business? How did you launch it? And how did you get into schools? Second is most fulfilling. Third, the biggest challenge about what you do. Okay. So when I first started, so I actually rebranded um, my company. But when I first started, this is about three years ago. And so early 2021 during the pandemic. And I reached out. So I went to four high schools and three colleges. And so, you know, I, I didn't mention that before, but I think it's relevant since you asked the question. And so when I was in 10th grade, I went to a, a school known as HUSAC, the HUSAC school, which is a private school, a private boarding school. Um, and that, again, that really had a huge impact on my life because that was the exposure that I didn't get, right? So when I grew up, my five closest friends were, were convicted felons. Um, and so, you know, that school was like, it was either that or I was going into foster, foster home. Mm. And so when I went to HUSAC, I only went for a year until I left, but that school is what kind of taught me structure, right? And I got sent away and now I'm wearing a suit and tie every day. And again, I was able to afford that because we were so broke, so we got financial aid. But not everybody has that same opportunity, which is why I, my business is doing what it does today and bridging that opportunity gap. But so during the pandemic, I had reached out to the head of school because at the time when I was at that school, Dean Foster was my dorm parent. So he was the head of admissions. And now, you know, years later, now he's the head of the school. Mm. And so being that I was somewhat of a success story, I circled back and I said, hey, I have this cybersecurity professional development skills training program, you know, partnered with the two largest certification issuing entities and with the Forbes Business Council. And I said, listen, I think it'd be a great opportunity to, you know, this kind of serve as an enrichment program for your students, specifically your BIPOC students at the school which they have about four students representing 40 something different countries. Mm. And so there's students from all over the world who go there, right? Some are, you know, financially, um, you know, disadvantaged. Some are from the wealthiest families in the nation. Mm. But, and so I, I pitched the idea to him and he didn't show up to the first three meetings. You know, he just, he fronted on me for the first three meetings and I sent him a message. I'm like, listen, you know, if you do that again, <laughs> right. I'm packing this shit up and right. I'm gonna go elsewhere because I kind of felt like he wasn't taking me serious. Mm. And so the fourth meeting he made mm. and he, you know, gave me full range of motion to do what I needed to do. And so, you know, we, we launched and that's kind of how I got started. And the reason why I was starting with that private school market is because I really want to be in the inner cities. I want to be in the DOE. I want to be at the Bronx Letters. I want to be at New in Newark. But the Department of Education and public school systems, they have so much red tape. Like you need a permission slip to wipe your nose. It's crazy. Like, you can't get shit done. Right. And so right. I was trying to reverse engineer the process because, you know, I'm an engineer by trade. And so I realized I was like, yo, if I could, you know, reverse engineer the process, partner with an esteemed institution, right, it's a lot easier to have that conversation with those schools. And so that was my, that was my thought process. And so I was able to launch with them. And of course, you know, working with HUSAC school, right? The best referral and marketing is, is through referrals. Sure. And so they obviously were, were championing our program. We've had some, you know, some legendary results there, helping students get internships, employment right out of high school, you know, the whole nine yards. And so, right, that school obviously, um, you know, was the, the, the birth of the program and helped us get more schools. And so this fall, we're gonna be launching with our, our third school, which is the uh, global, uh, excuse me, Urban Assembly School of Global Commerce in Harlem. Shout out mm. to Principal Viz. So they're going to be our third academic partner. Fire. 
And then, like I said, the, the, the group of young men who had their program called EOF, Extension of Family, they're gonna have representation on our circuit with those other three schools so that they can collaborate and compete. And so the ideology was, right, some of the inner city students that don't have the opportunity that I had, right, to get out are just as talented. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. as talented as the kids who are going to those private schools, but they weren't afforded the same opportunity or resources. And so our program serves as that opportunity gap where mm -hmm. we're gonna have, you know, those students get to collaborate and compete and we're gonna bridge the gap. And so that's, the, that's what we're doing this fall. We're gonna have four, four schools on our, on our circuit and participating in what I call the Young Professional Cybersecurity League. Like we're treating cybersecurity like a sport. It's like cyber athletics mm. because it's that important, right? Cybersecurity is that important to the world. And we, we learned about that you know, a month ago when, when the world came Hello? to a screeching halt, Hello? when CrowdStrike had that issue and sure. everybody was at a standstill. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing. What's the most fulfilling thing about what you do? Like, when you look back, okay, here's my question. At 18 years old, it was a scare that your life and your freedom was at risk, right? Yeah. And now you, you, I can see the passion. I can see what you're doing. And it's, it's not that far, bro. You're 29. Yes, sir. 11 years ago, right? Yeah. And you look in the mirror today, a father... Yes, sir. Business owner. Yes, sir. Making your mark in the world. What does it feel like? Are you paying attention to what's happening, of what you're currently doing? You know what I mean? Or you're caught up in the hustle and bustle. I got to get to where I got to get to. Like, have you sat back and said, yo, hold on. Here's where I'm at. And here's what I'm doing. Uh, I don't think I spend enough time reflecting in that, right? Um, just because, you know, we get caught up. I do work two, two, jo two jobs, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm, I've been overemployed for two years. So I work seven days a week um, and run a business and take care of, you know, my entire family. So I got two daughters, two beautiful daughters, beautiful fiance, the best mom in the world. And she allows me to be able to do what I do, take care of my mom, my mom's sister, who's my, my her, her twin. Mm -hmm. uh, so my aunt, Juju. Shout out to her, uh, my sister. I kinda, I'm like the bedrock of my family, so I don't get too, you know, um, you know, tied up in the thought of like what I'm doing, because I believe in it that much. It's like every day, so I just wake up and get straight to it. But I think the other thing is there's a lot of um, groundwork that has to get put in, and so you know we're like brute forcing our way, like we're kind of revolutionizing, you know, this industry. There's a lot. Right, we're kind of turning it upside down and inside out because there's not enough representation and you know things need to be changed. And so, you know, at the highest level. And so we're kind of lowering the barrier for entry without sacrificing the integrity or quality of education. And that could rub people the wrong way. That could rub powers that be the wrong way. And so I don't get too tied up in it, but at the same time, it's like it's necessary and it needs to be done. Mm. And so just based on my experience and all of the trials and tribulations that I had to overcome. Um, it kind of serves as the fuel for me to keep on going. And I hope I answered your question because I know I could sometimes go off on tangents, but. No, you're good. So, so the fulfillment part of it, right? Because, because you work, okay, here's another question. Seven days a week. Seven days a week since December 27th, 2022. Okay, more on a personal side of the question, right? Because how old are your kids? I have a five-month-old and a five, soon-to-be five-year-old. Congratulations on that, by Thank the way. You, bro. Right, um, and I, they're early. It's early enough where this this hustle you should doing right now, to some degree, is not. I don't know what the work schedule is, but at any given point, do you feel like you know this is taking so much time away from my family, and does that do do anything to you because of, hey, do I want to be the father that was always there or? The father who's out there putting in the, land, like the landscape and the groundwork to make sure that in 10, 20 years from now, when you understand what I was doing, you understand the sacrifice, does any of that at any given point do weigh any bearing in your thought process of what you're doing? I mean, yeah, it definitely does. But it also, at the same time, I think a big part of it is you know having a great partner, right? Because, you know, right, if, if you have a great partnership, right, marriage and, you know, who you choose to create a family with, that's a business. Mm. And, and, you know, I treat it as such. And so, um, you know, my girl does a great job as a mom. 
she she really is. I mean, my five year old, she's in school, so you know that that obviously is helpful. Um, my five month old is a, <laughs> she's uh, what we call a Velcro baby. You know, she's stuck to her mom's boob, mm-hmm. and she's a breastfed baby. So, mm-hmm. um, I actually pay a mobile babysitter to go with her to work, so mm-hmm. she can continue to do her job because she works part time. And you know, I want to make sure that my daughter's not you know, like having to be at a daycare. Right. And so. Um, I handle my responsibilities uh, on that front. And, you know, another luxury of this is I, I've been working from home since 2019. So I don't go into an office and travel and do all that. You know, I work from my living room, my office. I go downstairs, kiss my daughter, play with her, go back, get on a meeting, come back down, tickle her. You know, like that's kind of like the, 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 the reality of my situation. And that's a blessing because not everybody can do that when they got to be on site and they're, you know, slinging cement over their shoulder or they got to be in an office and, so for me, it's like I have that luxury and that freedom. And so that's something I don't take for granted. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think right now, more than ever, I feel like in 2024, if you're an able-bodied male and you ain't working seven days a week, you're playing yourself. Mm. Because right now I have the ability to do it. And so there's not a day that goes by I don't get up and get straight to it. So I don't feel bad for that because this skill set, like I said, has afforded me the opportunity to take care of my family at the highest level. You know, I got three life insurance policies. You know, my children are gonna be, they're gonna be straight. They are straight. Right now, if I, God forbid something happens tomorrow, my family's a seven figure, family's seven figures. Mm. And like I said, like coming from where I come from, like, like that's a game changer. So, like I said, I think the fact that I work so much. I still find that balance. I don't know if it's a Libra thing. Shout out to all the Libras. Hello. You know Dang. how we do. You know how we seven, do. I'm a seven day a week. Yeah. Right after so, her, like, you know what I mean? So I don't feel bad f- about it. Uh, my girl certainly certainly doesn't make me feel bad about it. Fire. You know, my kids love to see me. They treat me like a superhero. Mm-hmm. And they're the fuel that I need to keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's all about a sacrifice and delayed gratification because I'm doing what I'm doing now so that later on in life I could be chilling. Mm. Right? And... This skill set has allowed me to be making a quarter million dollars from home. This skill set has allowed me to invest in real estate and have a cash flow property. This this business and line of work has allowed me to, you know, create my kids' brokerage accounts. Uh, you know, this skill set has allowed me to, you know, earn my leisure. Hello. Shout out to EYL. Earn my freedom. Mm-hmm. And so you're either gonna, you know, put your time in now or you suffer the consequences later. Mm. And so one person told me, shout out to my, my mentor, Frank, you know, he said, the easy way is the hard way and the hard way is the easy way. And so for me, coming from where I come from, like I'm no stranger to this struggle, so I'd rather put my time in now. And I'm enjoying it. Like I'm not waiting to reach a certain level for me to enjoy it mm. or for me to say, you know what, I'm happy. I wake up every single day. I was waking up happy growing up, sleeping on a couch with bed bugs. Mm. I was happy because one thing I learned growing up and shout out to my mother. She said that no matter how hard it is, there's someone always has it worse. And so when we were doing those zigzags and the stairwells and I was stepping over bodies and crack smoke, my mom used to say, yeah, when we turn, when we turn on the light switch and those, those roaches scattered, and when I was literally waking up in the middle of the night because my sister was screaming because she was bleeding from her arms, getting eaten alive mm-hmm. by bed bugs, and when we caught 37 mice in our house in one week, my mom used to say, but that person sleeping in the stairwell will trade places with you in the hot New York City second. Mm. And it's true. Because they're sleeping in the pissy stairwell and I'm complaining about the couch. So somebody always has it worse. And I think that's what really just keeps me going. Bro, that's a message, dog. You know, there's something that I, I, I'm identifying in our conversation. Shout out to your mom. Shout out to my mom. Superhero your mom as she is, right? How, well, how Shout out to you, all the mothers out there. All the mothers out there. I mean... I love you, Dad, but Mom got it. I'm gonna be real with you. you. Feel me? Like that's the superhero. <laughs> Mom got it. Mom got it. What was that? It was there a relationship with your father growing up, right? In this process of you going through all the struggle, was his absence something that also thri- like pushes you today to be the man that you are with your family at work? What was that relationship like? Uh, it was non-existent. You know, um, my dad left when I was an infant. So I think I was around like six months old. My dad, he um, he beat the shit out of my mom. She was seconds from death. Jesus. And and so he was actually forced by the state to leave. 
to, to leave the state and to, 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 to not be around. And so, um, no, he didn't, I didn't grow up with my father. And I think that, you know, every boy that grows up without their father has a void in their chest, the shape of their dad. And that I definitely resonated with and in my adult life have taken steps to rehabilitate because, you know, I, I don't want my ego to get in the way of me being able to be a great father to my kids. And so mm -hmm. I've reached out to him. I've tried to build a relationship. And um, over the years I have, I mean, I could count on my two hands how many times I've even like spent, been around my father. But I think looking back now, I understand why. Like I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of shadow work to understand the why as to why he wasn't around. And I feel like it was a good thing because, because of the challenges he was struggling with, I feel like it probably would have impacted me in a negative way. And so, um, yeah, growing up without a father, it definitely um, had an impact. It definitely had an impact on me. Um, but I didn't let that be the excuse. And I think there's three types of people in the world. Like, there's people who make excuses there's people who make excuses for their excuses, and then there's people who get straight to it. And I like to be in that third bracket because I don't play the victim. Mm. I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't lay down. I get busy. And I didn't want to be a statistic, you know? I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be one of those people that blame their circumstances for why they aren't where they are or why they aren't where they want to be. I wanted to be one of those people that was an anomaly, right? And so I kind of took an unorthodox approach. And so, um, yeah, my father, he, he, he had a lot of struggles. He, you know, he had a lot of challenges. You know, my family on my father's side, I was kind of sheltered from growing up. I didn't, I didn't know too much about the family history. You know, my mom's side is, is Jewish, but my dad's side is, is black and Polish. And so, you know, I always saw pictures and I always, you know, was talked about. Like my mom would always say, you look just like your dad. You know, you sound just like your father. And that was like, it was hard to hear that because she would use that as like, it was like a, a weapon. Mm. You know, it was like when, 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 when I was doing something she liked, she was like, you look like just like your father. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing something she didn't, she was like, you look just like your father. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Ma, like, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? That it? was traumatizing. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm rightfully so. Like, I mean, I was troubled growing up. Like I had a lot of misplaced anger. And I can say that honestly now as an adult, but I understand, I understand, and I'm blessed to be able to get to this place of understanding because a lot of people, they would not even be fucking with their father if they knew the shit that they, that, that they knew, like if they, their father beat their mom, mm -hmm. right? But my mother never raised me with that type of heart. She always taught me, you know, take the good and leave the bad. And mm -hmm. so I was raised from a place of love, right? Despite the challenges, despite because she her mm -hmm. imperfections, of mm -hmm. course. And as a parent now, I understand like mm -hmm. nobody's perfect. Right. But yeah, it gave me that that heart to see things through a different lens. And so I I understand that my father wasn't around was probably the best thing that probably couldn't happen to me at the time. You know, and just, you know, talking to him and understanding his struggle and the family that he was born into and the, the crime. And, you know, my father was shot three times. Like, mm. he was really in the streets. Mm. He was really like, you know, and I was, I, I, I would say he really didn't have a choice because of what the family was involved with. Mm. And, you know, I won't go into too much detail, but I think when you have an experience like that with no guidance and the people that are closest to you are, you know, are wrapped in it too. You kind of like, there's no way out. Mm. And you know, that was his experience. Mm. And so for me, like, I didn't want to be like him in those ways. I wanted to be like him in the good ways. Right. I wanted to wear my last name proud. Mm. And, and that's kind of what I've done. Oh, that's a message, bro. I even appreciate you sharing that. Sure. You know, as a person hearing you, there's two things that stood out to me. If somebody's watching this, it's probably, you know, has some resentment or, or, or looking back at their childhood and, misplaced anger and then also that void like how do you find your identity in this process like is there was there a, a, another man another another like was it a boys and girls club like how did you find this peace or tame that misplaced anger like what was your outlet 
was right here the whole time. Mm. I would say, um, you know, speaking to my father gave me clarity, you know, because the things that he shared with me are things that my mom's probably not even aware of, you know? And so there's two sides to every story. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I had to dig for that, you know, like I really had to dig and I had to put in the work, right? My father didn't put, put the work in to build a relationship with me. I had to put that work mm. in. And so, you know, you have to have humility in order to do that. And so I knew that I was being selfish in that respect. You know, I forgave my father as a selfish act. Hmm. You understand? Because holding on to that trauma, to that load, was only weighing me down and was only going to prevent me from being the person and now ultimately the father that I know I can be. And so it was a selfish act, but um, it was the shadow work that I needed. I needed those answers because when I was growing up, I had a, a, a super identity crisis. Mm. You know, my mom's side, like I said, is Jewish, mm. even though we weren't like a, like a religious family and my, my household was still like mixed in the sense that my mom, my sister's father's from El Salvador. I grew up a minority amongst minorities, meaning my entire building was Hispanic, you know, infested with MS-13, Latin King. So we were like, I grew up with the lady, my neighbor knocking on my door, que les tamales, papuses? Like, you know, <laughs> that's how we, you know what I'm saying? Like, you go into a synagogue, that's motherfuckers right. never had a papusa. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> you know, and Fuck. so I grew up speaking Spanish, mm. you know, and in and, and, and that type of environment. And so, you know, for me, I could never relate to that to that group. You know, I was five years old wearing a do-rag, listening to 50 Cent on a CD player. Mm. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, what, what, these Jewish boys and girls, they don't, mm -hmm. they can't relate. Mm. So, you know, having, you know, just um, the opportunity and, and, and doing that, that due diligence, like seeing pictures of my grandfather, who's a black man, seeing pictures of my uncle, seeing pictures of my father, like, I wanted to know. What, what, what's that all? What, what's my father's side like? Mm. I got 100 cousins. My dad's a child of 13. Wow. So I got cousins that are up the street. And so I wanted to know. Like, I wanted to be exposed to that. I wanted to know what's up. Like, right. what's going on? Mm. Like, what's, the, what, what's, 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 what's my last name really mean? Mm. And, you know, I did that. I did that work. And so, you know, at 27 years old, I kind of really like solved the mysteries and that crisis. Because when I walk now, I walk different. Because mm. I understand exactly who the fuck I am. I understand what my last name means. Mm. I wear it different, you know? And so I stand before you today a man of integrity. I stand before you today a man that represents the good fight because I'm the first, I'm the first Sims in generations that isn't a convicted felon, that, that, that isn't practicing, you know, a set of rules and protocols that leads to two places that are in prison. I'm the first Sims that is going to ensure and guarantee that my children are trust fund babies, that they're beneficiaries. And they have a platform and a foundation that's bigger than me. Bro. Yeah. That was, bro, honestly, I'm going to tell you something right now. The decision to fight the good fight. This is why it's, it's admirable, bro, because everyone has a story. There's two stories I think we all have. The story that we actually live and then the story that we sell ourselves. Mm. All right? Like... What is really going on? Like, what options do we really have? Like, what problems do we really have opposed to the ones we sell ourselves to either move forward or stay still? And you had options here, man. Like, your circumstances, the target group that you decide to do, the field that you're in, dog. Like, most challenging thing is what I was going to say. What's the most challenging thing about the cyberspace that... 
we don't know that you you go through every single day or periodically that you wish you can change or in a mission to change? I think the what I'm trying to change is I'm trying to remove the barriers, you know. And so for me, when I when I was in when I was in college, right, I didn't have the experience, so I had to create the experience. And so, you know, a lot of people think that because they go to college again. I know people with four years degrees working at Shoprite, right? You know what I mean, right? And so, just because you go to college doesn't mean that you're guaranteed a job. So I had to figure out like what is that like the blueprint, right? I had to double down. And I and and really, you know, work twice as hard as the people I was in class with because I'll never forget this. I was in discrete mathematics, sitting front row, you know, taking notes every time my professor would take a breath. I'm like notating it. I'm paying attention in that much detail. And the kids next to me got their feet up Chilling. watching Dragon Ball Z. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? How are y'all not even paying attention right now? Right. Like, I'm over right. here losing track of what's going on, paying full attention. He's watching YouTube. He's watching Dragon Ball Z. Mm -hmm. The fuck is going on? <laughs> like, I'm still getting, I'm just getting by. Right. And, you know, and, you know, but it, they were exposed to this. Mm -hmm. They were doing this when they were 10. Right. And so I had to work overtime. And so putting, you know, everything into perspective, it was like when I got to my four year school after I transitioned from National Community College into Plattsburgh, you know, I remember I was trying out for the basketball team because at that point in my life when I was at Maris, everything, everything revolved around basketball, ball is life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got cut. I didn't make the team because they had a bunch of recruits and returning players. So they took one, there was one spot available mm -hmm. and I didn't make it, but I gave it my everything. Mm -hmm. Like I put in work, bro, for three months with the team working out, right? And I didn't make it. But what that taught me was in that moment, I pivoted my entire focus to cyber. So I was literally like, I, all I need to focus on right now is when I graduate, having a job, because if I don't, I'm going back to my mom's couch. Hello. Like, that's the reality Hello. of my life. I don't got a safety net. I don't have a plan B. I don't have that nest egg. Because if I don't have a job when I graduate, I'm going back home to a couch. And my mom is on food stamps in Section 8. So I have to make it make sense. And so at that moment, I put all my eggs in one basket. I was like, all right, I got to do whatever I got to do. And that's really what I did. I literally, at that moment, I joined the software engineering club. I got on the board of that. I wanted to be around the people who knew more than I did. Mm -hmm. And so I had to intermingle with them. Again, mm -hmm. coming from my background, getting acclimated in any environment, I can understand those people, even though most people who come from where we come from would be like, bruh, fuck is y'all talking about? Right. I knew that those are the people I need to get around because those are going to be my greatest assets when I don't know what the fuck this program means. Mm. And so I got on the board of the Software Engineering Club. I got on the board of NABA, the National, the National Association of Black Accountants. And I remember when I did that, people were like, you're not a black accountant. I'm like, first and foremost, you don't know me. Right. Right? Mind your fucking business. <laughs> but black. second of all, y'all are too motherfucking shallow. Mm. And NABA was a, was a professional organization outside of college. So I knew I was joining that club to get value in terms of my professional development. And so I got on the board of NABA on the membership committee, told everyone and their mother to come to our events, and I started to build relationships. And so those were two things that I was using to build my portfolio to stack my experience so that I could identify with the role. And so I think that was the most important thing I want people to take away is that having a degree and a certification, that means nothing if you don't identify with the role. If you're applying for a job that says cybersecurity analyst, and the first thing under your resume is barista at Starbucks, then you're not getting the job. Right. Because you don't identify with the role. You right. make coffee. Right. right. Right? And so those two clubs were helping me build that portfolio so that I was pushing the experience that the Louis Vuitton and the Rolex that didn't apply mm -hmm. off my resume. Mm -hmm. And then after I did the clubs, I did what's called an independent study. And an independent study is a four credit individual project. Most people don't know that they can do. Hello. When they're in college, as long as you get permission by the dean, you can then do a project which can serve as an internship, which can serve as college credit. And that could literally take the place of a general ed, like a philosophy or something that would take up your time, but really provide no value in the space. And so what I did was, I, I didn't realize this at first, but my landlord, when I moved off, co uh, off campus, he was an ex IBM person. So the project that I was doing, he was mentoring me the whole time. 
And so when I did a, when I did a, a project, my project was setting up a, a firewall on my home network using an open source firewall called PF Sense. And the, my landlord was literally helping me connect the, the wires like to my router, to my access point. And that's literally what I did to have my like third experience and to build my resume. Mm. And the, the summer before I graduated, I actually stayed up at school and I got a part-time job working at the help desk so I can get more IT experience again, continuing to build that resume hands-on, not just the school and the classes, but hands-on outside of the classroom. And at that point, the fall semester of my senior year, I helped the director of the computer cybersecurity department build out our what's known today as the Cybersecurity Center for Technology. And I became a co-director and I started to manage like 40 interns. And so three months before graduation, March 15, 2018, I got a full-time job offer from Michelin working on their global security team, making six figures three months before I graduated. If I stumble upon, right? If I stumble upon this interview, brand new, whoever you are, thank you. If you come, if you came here for TJ, cool. If you came here because you saw my beard and you said, how can I get a beard like that? That's a different episode. You feel <laughs> how me? can I get a beard like that? <laughs> <laughs> like, what would I do? All right, I guess this is because it's amazing what you've done and there's an extensive experience, right? There's, there's things that you used your background and your and your 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 analysis and, and, and your experiences from before you got behind the computer, right? Because you work from home or not. If if you were starting today, if I watch this interview and say, you know what? That's something I want to do. Where do I start? What do you recommend someone watch this interview for the first time? But besides getting on the Zoom call that we're about to do, we got to yes, set sir. that up. Yeah, definitely. What do you recommend? What are the steps to take to get in this field and end up landing a six-figure job or something? I think right? So I think it's, there's a different path for everybody, but I have something to say for everyone. So if you're a high school student, and that's kind of what our mission is, is again, we're, we're, we believe that if you expose the youth earlier, right, yep. early career exploration is the key. One, we're saving lives. For because sure. if you're waiting for these kids to figure it out when they're in college, some of these kids are not even going to have an opportunity to go to college. That's a fact. Right? And so we got to get to them earlier in the pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. And so early career exploration is key. But... So if you're a high school student, if you get someone at ninth grade and you give them the resources, the ecosystem, right, the infrastructure and the leadership, by the time they're a senior and they graduate, they have more experience than your average college graduate and they can be deployed into an enterprise environment and contribute immediately, right? Mm -hmm. We have to take that, right? If you're 18, you could serve at war, but you're not going to allow someone to work. Come on. Make it make sense. Come on. Right? And so that's what we're disrupting in the space. So if you're a high school student, right, there's tons of resources that you can leverage to get those skills now, mm -hmm. right? And so our program is accredited by EC Council, which is, we're an accredited training center, EC Council. They're the, the largest or one of the largest uh, IT certification issuing entities. So I think the, the certifications, I think are important to complement and to build the baseline, mm -hmm. but they're not the end all be all. Great. So if you're a high school or college student, you should be focusing on hands-on experience. And you can earn that experience in the ways I just shared. Go start a club, right? You can start a club at your school, whether you're in high school or college, mm -hmm. become the president of that club, build a community that way, okay. free 99, uh -huh. right? You can do an independent project, okay? Whether you're in college or high school. If you're in high school, you can do an independent project. Mm -hmm. If you're in college, you could do an independent study and get the approval from the dean serves as college credit and an internship. Mm -hmm. And these are the steps that you need to take in order to be able to attract the employers mm -hmm. to play in the big leagues. Because my school didn't have JP Morgan, Microsoft coming. I had Aflac. You know what I'm saying? I had right. State Farm and fucking <laughs> Geico. They right. wasn't coming to our school. I went to a non-target school. Right. We right. were the bottom right. of the barrel. Right. So right. if you don't have the experience, you got to create the experience. Okay. So whether you're in high school or college, focus on that. Join a club. If you don't have a club, start a club. Do an independent study. If they have a center for your school, get tapped in. If they don't build one, got it. right? Start doing an internship, even if it's free, because experience, okay, is going to pay you handsomely on the back end. Trust me. And so those are five things right there, mm -hmm. right? In addition to that, 
companies have while you're in school is when you should be doing the most work. So companies have accelerated programs, apprenticeship programs that are open and only open to students currently mm. in school. So I don't care where you are. If you're a high school graduate and you didn't get into, you know, the Baruch, SUNY school, the Baruch, 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 right? right? Go to the local community college, go to Western Governors University, mm. right? Go to a small community college just to say you're in college, college. okay? Mm. And I if you're broke, college. leverage being broke. Mm. Because if you, say, if you can check the box and say that you're currently pursuing a degree, then you could qualify for IBM's apprenticeship program. You could qualify for Google's apprenticeship program. You could qualify for you know the big four, Deloitte's accelerator programs. And those internships, those programs have an 80 to 90% conversion rate to full-time employment. And so that's how you get in the door. And those internships are a lot of times are paid when you're getting a private or a public entity get like those internships can be $40 an hour. Like they, they could be paying you real nice, mm. right? While you're in school. And so those are things that you can do right now um, to get an experience. And I think a lot more people should become business owners. I think a lot more people should incorporate because one of the things that I preach and that I harp on a lot is not everyone Right. Not everyone is meant to be a business owner, but everyone can have a business. Right. Hmm. And what I mean by that is if you incorporate yourself, right, you could be the lead research analyst of your firm and you could be providing free services to nonprofits. And as long as you have a, a, a contact and a reference and a referral, right, with the executive director or whoever, you know, the volunteer at the front desk, right, then that, res that experience can go on your resume. Talking. Gems, right? Here. And that's how you identify with the role. TJ, what's what's the goal in the next five to ten years? Like all this work you're putting in now. If we could fast forward, we sit back here, we're right back in this because this is gonna be the you know we come back, we sit back and play your bro. For sure, this shit going viral. Hello, it was like yo, we had this conversation. What did you want to do? Ultimately, if I could sit back and we drink, we have another drink like this, it's what is, what's the outline for what you want and what is it you want to see the next five to 10 years? What I'd like to see is I'd like to see the, the, the magnificent seven. I'd like to see the big four. I'd like to see, you know, fortune 50 companies hiring high school students, mm. right? I would like to see those companies putting their money where their mouth is, right? And I say that because going back to what I mentioned earlier, if you take a, a high school student, which when you're in ninth grade, you're a high school student, like you're the most vulnerable to what life has to offer, right? You're like, you can go that way, you can go that way, but right, when you reach the youth earlier, um, you can really, you can really, set them up for success. And so you take a ninth grader, you give them the ecosystem, the community, the resources, the leadership, right? Then they'll have an opportunity at the finish line to, to change the trajectory of their lives. So if these companies are, are more willing to accept non-traditional backgrounds in tech and, and, and to, to partner with organizations like mine, right? And put their money where their mouth is, whether it be in, the, in, in, in terms of access to industry tool sets, right? Um, you know, funding, right? Human capital mm -hmm. can be technical training. Mm -hmm. So providing their, their, their leadership, um, you know, providing access to their licenses. A Splunk license can cost like 10 grand, right? That's out of reach for a lot of people, right? The average person is never going to have that opportunity to read, right? But there are tons of free resources out there. But what I would like to say, if we're talking five or 10 years from now, is I would like for you know, high school graduates to have an opportunity to, to work at these organizations, right? If they can give up their life and serve their country, then they should, the college degree shouldn't be the one thing standing in their way, mm. right? From obtaining that, because the reality is like, it doesn't make sense to go into debt 50K where you can't make a job making 40. That don't make sense. That's actually a cancer in our community. And so, right, that's something that I would like to see changed. You know, I would like to see a, I would like to see a, a, a million black, brown, Latin youth in cyberspace by 2027. I would like to see that. And to be honest with you, that does, that's not a lot, 
right? That's actually like a small, that's a small goal mm. in the grand scheme of things because in terms of cybercrime damages, right? In 2021, we observed $6 trillion in cybercrime damages. Six T with a trillion. In 2023, cybercrime damages exceeded $8 trillion. And in 2025, cybercrime damages are gonna be exceeding $10.5 trillion. Now, the scary part about what I just said is that the cybersecurity industry is only worth $400 billion. So when you look at those numbers, right, $10.5 trillion, if we were to measure cybersecurity damages in terms of GDP, it would be the third largest global economy after the US and China. And so when you break those numbers down, $8 trillion, that's $665 billion a month, which is twice the industry valuation and market cap in one month of cybercrime damages, which is like $275,000 a second. A million dollars just got lost. A million dollars was just stolen. And so that's not, a, that's not a big goal in the grand scheme of things. And it's only going to continue to expand with the use of and adoption of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, blockchain technology. Bro, what I got to do to save my life, dog? <laughs> like, 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 like it clo look, here's what I want you to share, because this, I think, is a great way to close as well. For sure. You were telling me something about, so, okay, first step. How to secure myself right now from all like Okay. Okay. Right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I got this link of, you know, change your email, but then if I put my password, I remember my password that I use my face ID. Like what's safe? What do you recommend? For sure. You know, so that way I have to give in all that information. I'm nervous. Get off my Wi Fi, all of y'all. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's like, the first thing I asked you for, right? right? <laughs> nah, I didn't. Nah. But um I think really we gotta stick to the fundamentals, right? And I think that goes for anything. Mm -hmm. Like we we tend to forget the fundamentals, but just you know, plain and simple, um, updates, right? If everybody goes and checks their phone, whether you have an iPhone or you're on an Android, I have an iPhone, but if you go into your, your, your app store, I can guarantee right now, even mine, I can look at my, app, my phone right now, and I can see like there's probably a bunch of red dots, right, saying update your software, update this app. Th these bugs were, were uncovered. And that's really because, like I said, excuse me, there's every single day a new zero day exploit, right? There's, there's a new CVE, we call it a CVE, Common Vulnerability and Exposure that's identified where that surfaces for this company, that app, that software. And so companies like a game of cat and mouse, they're constantly trying to patch it so that they can you know, fix, and, you know, fix that bug and that back door. Mm -hmm. And so um, making sure that your systems are constantly being updated is one of the first, and I say most prominent things that you can do to stay secure. Mm -hmm. Making sure that you're right. Your, your, your applications and your software is up to date. Anybody could do that. It doesn't take a genius, right. right? And so that first and foremost, I would say just strengthening your password management because the average person is using the same password for their banking system as they are for their Instagram. And so a lot of people just like recycle the same password. They'll mm -hmm. use the, you know, their Facebook password and they'll use that's the same password they're using for their, their little LinkedIn and their LinkedIn, the same password they're using for their bank, Facts. right? Whether you face ID or not, right? That authentication is still the same. And so I would say implementing a password management strategy and you can do that in the form of a password vault. So they have these password managers that are like a vault. Think of like a bank vault where you have one master code and that one master code, don't forget. Like, don't right, forget right, that master right, code right, 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 right. because that's the, the, the key that's going to unlock your vault with all of your passwords. And so these password managers, a really good one is 1Password, um, LastPass, KeyPass. Again, even these password managers have been cracked. So again, what do we learn? There's no such thing as 100% secure. Right, it's never right, a matter right, of right, if, right. it's only a matter of when, but it increases your chances of being tre tremendously. Correct. And so one password is a great tool. They have tons of them, like I said. Um, and so strengthening your password management, having that one master password where then you have a vault of different complex passwords is going to eliminate 90% of the password cracker dictionary attacks and binary attacks that you're using with fluffy one, two, three. And you know what I'm saying? Or a bunch of different words in the dictionary and these computers are cracking, you know, dictionary 
every word in the dictionary in a second. Mm -hmm. And so using a password manager where you can set your password for your Canva to be 50, a 50 character string is going to significantly increase, you know, your password security. And if it takes a hundred years to crack your password, is it secure? Hello. All right. It's, I would say it's secure. We ain't going to be here in a hundred. Well, maybe we will, depending upon how the healthcare system and biotechnology mm -hmm. is, but that will definitely be another thing that you can help strengthen your cybersecurity hygiene. Um, and then I think also the implementation of, you know, using a VPN, right? A virtual private network, which is really used for encrypting your traffic. So when your traffic is on the internet, it's in plain text. So if you're going to a website and you see like HTTP, mm -hmm. that's running on port 80, right? Which is a logical port. That traffic on the web, on the network, when it boils down to the bits and the bytes is not encrypted. So if you're at the airport connecting to public Wi-Fi and you're accessing a website or putting in credentials on a non-encrypted URL or website or domain, right, then that traffic can then be seen if there's somebody connected to the network because you're using public Wi-Fi, you're at Starbucks, you know what I'm saying? You're wherever you are using public Wi-Fi, let's just say. If there's somebody on that network with a packet sniffer like Wireshark, which is just a tool, right? they can capture that traffic and it's in clear text. So, right, using a VPN encrypts your traffic. It's like a tunnel. Mm. And so that's something that we need to be more familiar with and start using. Um, implementation, implement, implementing, implementing multi-factor authentication. So, right, MFA, two-factor authentication. So even if someone did compromise your credentials, your password, your, your email, having that additional layer of security right, where they have to send a one-time code in the form of a text, in the form of an email, right? That's another layer of what we call defense in depth, right? And so, again, this is all fundamentals that we know, but we just don't practice, right? But this will prevent you from being hacked because an attacker is going to use different tactics and techniques and procedures, right, and get the lowest hanging fruit so they can obtain unauthorized access. So if you harden your environment and your systems and your devices, it'll be you know, too big of a target and some things are just not worth people's time. And so those are a couple of things I would say, you know, just I recommend right out the gate and there's tools like Bitwarden, uh, Bitdefender, there's tools, like I said, like 1Password, Nor Norton 360, like there's different solutions out there where the average person can just, you know, maybe to, to get all of the features you pay $2.99 a month, like $2.99, uh, right? Uh, sure. But the average person, I mean, goes up the street and buys a Dutch, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, Talk about what's it. important. Right. And I think, you know, those are things that we can be. And then also just keep in mind that sometimes the greatest threat is in your inbox. You know, sometimes the greatest threat is in your email. And so when you say you got an email, right, being able to identify a real, a phishing email is really important because a lot of times people don't even know, but their email could be spoofed. Like the to and the from headers in the email could be spoofed to look like it's the address, but on the reality, the real sender email, you got to look in the request ID, the referrer, and be able to like look at it. Or the URL you think you're clicking at actually has a redirect link to a spoofed fake, you know, Microsoft 365 mm -hmm. login. And you don't know that because you didn't analyze the URL. Right, you think it says Microsoft.com, but it says Microsoft.com with two N's, or right, there's an obscurity somewhere. And so being able to identify a phishing email and just doing that extra step of due diligence, it could be the difference of you being a victim or not. And so these are just things that I think that people can do, right, without really any heavy lifting, but just be more aware of. CJ, let me tell you something, bro. In this living room, we've had a lot of conversations, right? Uh proud to say that. Saying things like it's a place where we learn. Today was a learning, huh? Learning about resiliency, education, purpose, why. All right, it was, was displayed in such a great way. Uh, moments where we laughed about what was going on. And, and even hearing the pieces of what you had to do, the inner works to heal the man that you didn't know about to become a father you were supposed to be, bro, displayed an incredible conversation. You, it was an honor and Appreciate pleasure. You. Let me tell you right now, man. Get around the people that stretch you. If this did something for you, just do us a favor. Share this with somebody you know. Um, comment in the section. You already know what it is. It's the living room. With your favorite, Boja Dominican from the Bronx, Rob the Rose, or what we learned. Yeah, 
laugh, and heal. My man, you My killed it. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank love, you for bro. having me, bro. Boy. Valid? Valid.